Joining us now is someone who I really admire and respect. He is the clearest thinker when it comes to anything foreign policy. He loves America, and he's willing to speak courageously and truthful. It's Colonel Douglas McGregor. Colonel, thank you for taking the time. Colonel, how should America respond, if at all, and how should we think about the massacre that occurred over this weekend in Israel? Well, we will obviously support and assist the Israelis uh, with what they're trying to do. They've assembled 470,000 troops, uh, a force larger than the United States Army, to deal with Hamas. But our principal concern at this point is for the Israelis to execute this mission without widening the war. We want to contain this. The worst thing that could happen would be for other regional actors to become involved. Now, the, the attacks were tragic, and they shouldn't surprise anyone because Gaza is a boiling pot of hatred and anger, uh, all of which is directed at Israel, not necessarily with complete justification. Doesn't matter. That's what you've got in that place. Uh, that's an entirely different issue. And we, you know, anyone who watched what happened yesterday is appalled. But emotion must not control our actions. We need to think carefully. And our biggest concern should be to contain this conflict and avoid anything that would widen it. So, Colonel, are you concerned or should we be concerned that some politicians are going to try and have malevolent intentions and capitalize on emotion to get us into a broader regional conflict, for example, with U.S. troops against Iran? Oh, absolutely. Uh, former Secretary of State Pompeo was on beating the drums for war, arguing for a quote-unquote strike at the heart of the beast, uh, Iran. He's been trying to start a war with Iran for at least a decade or more. Uh, that's no surprise. Uh, Mike Huckabee, uh, who claims to be a, a pastor, insists that uh, this is also an attack on the United States, which of course is not true. If we uh, decided to launch a war against all of the various forces attacking our society, we would be at war uh, inside our own country in perpetuity. Uh, this is this is all nonsense. Now, we, we are in no position to fight a major war. We don't want to fight a major war. We are on the precipice of, of doing exactly that in Ukraine if we're not careful. Mm -hmm. The last thing we need is a major war in the Middle East. It will destroy our economy. It will destroy the global economy. And it will ultimately, in my judgment, result in the destruction of Israel. Now, we don't have the forces available. Uh, our forces are in ruins. We don't have the capability to directly intervene in anything and shape the outcome. And this is the problem. You begin taking actions and you have no idea what the consequences of your actions will be. The notion that we should attack Iran is absurd. Turkey is equally concerned with what's happening. And frankly speaking, Turkey is a much greater power and it's currently smarting under the experience of having one of their drones shot down by us. So the Turks are, are, are looking into this with uh, dangerous eyes in my judgment. We don't want a wider war. We want Israel to complete the task with Hamas, do so as quickly and as expeditiously as possible, and we don't want this war to widen. So, Colonel, I'm going to ask you a question here. Something doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Where I've been to Israel many times. It's a fortified country. It is a fortress of a country. I visited Gaza. I remember I went to a, uh, not Gaza, I visited the Gaza Strip right up to the border. And I remember I went to a coffee shop. And just at the coffee shop, there were over 10 to 15 people, IDF soldiers with, you know, guns just around their backs, just very casually. Colonel, am I right in pursuing the question of there's more to the story here? I find this very hard to believe that Israeli intelligence had no idea on the 50-year anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. W were they double-crossed? Was this a failure of Mossad? Was this them turning an eye, kind of like Golda Meir did 50 years ago, where she decided not to act on intelligence to win uh, support from other nations? What do you think about this? Well, the quick answer is to say that we don't know all of the facts today any more than in uh, October of 1973, everyone knew all of the facts. So we, we, we just don't know the answer to all of your questions. What we can say, though, is this. Uh, enemies have a bad habit of doing what you least expect. And we, Israel, Great Britain, many countries historically have be, become arrogant 
in, in their sense of confidence and overwhelming power. It's always a mistake. And I think what we saw happen with uh, Hamas was something that was undoubtedly building over time. I, I'm, I'm absolutely certain that Iranian and Turkish advisors and trainers inside uh, the Gaza Strip or outside of it in northern Egypt, no doubt prepared them for what they did. And, and remember, this is something the Arabs had never been able to do in the past. You know, the Arabs are very loquacious. They talk about everything. They never shut up, to be blunt. And so it was very easy, it was very easy for the Israelis to track them, to monitor them, and to know what they were going to do. Well, that didn't happen this time. And the Israelis were genuinely surprised. They were surprised by new tactics, new approach, the cohesion, the leadership, uh, the weaponry, everything. Everything came as a surprise. It's, you know, people think this is unusual. It's not unusual historically. We went through something similar during the Battle of the Bulge. And if you go back to Custer and his cavalry force, uh, his biggest concern when he attacked the Sioux was that they would run away because that's what they'd always done. Instead, he ended up fighting not only the Sioux, but all these tribes that had never united, and he was annihilated. So these, these kinds of things happen. The Israelis will recover. I would argue they've already begun to do so, and I think they can be successful. But there are other variables here, Charlie. The Egyptians want to send in a humanitarian convoy to relieve suffering in Gaza. Gaza is about 140 square miles. The Israelis don't want that to happen. They want to squeeze the population in Gaza, but this may not be possible. The last thing that Israel wants to do is end up in a fighting war or a shooting war with uh, the Egyptians, who have already said they plan to stay neutral. But they do want to provide some medical assistance and support and so forth to the uh, population. And then you have Mr. Erdogan in Turkey, who is meeting with the Secretary General of the United Nations and is also going to meet with President Putin. And he's already talked about, uh, on humanitarian grounds, the impossibility of cutting off electricity and water to Gaza. So the Israelis are in a difficult position. Uh, I'm sympathetic to them, as I'm sure everyone is. We want to see them succeed, but they've got to proceed carefully. In the meantime, we should have diplomats in the region working to ensure that this conflict does not spread. Yes. Uh, we need yes. we need to identify everyone's interest and see what we can do to meet it. Instead of treating everyone as a potential enemy, we need to start looking at people as potential partners in containing this conflict. If we don't do that, if we do what Pompeo and Huckabee and others are saying, then we risk more than just a regional war. If if there is an attack on Iran, if Turkey becomes involved, this will not stop. It will spread rapidly. We should expect the Russians, and obviously, though distant, the Chinese to back whatever the Russians, the Iranians, and the Turks do. This is a war we don't want to fight. So we need to find a way to prevent it. Yeah, I mean, and Turkey's part of NATO, which I'm going to ask you after the right. break. I mean, so what you're saying, I mean, this is this whole NATO project is just is just such a disgrace to our intelligence and anyone with reason. So a, a NATO, quote unquote, ally according to you, was helping Hamas go after Israel? I mean, I, I, I want to unpack that after the break. But I agree 100%, Colonel, that if we are not careful, this will turn into a regional war, which, again, I'm not trying to get people in the panic, but we could get into a world war over this, okay? This thing could get completely and totally out of control because of a massacre that occurred in Israel. And my other fear is that Netanyahu, who is temporarily humiliated very well might overreact and try to broaden this and extend this beyond what just happened with Hamas. That is a fear of mine because now we have Hezbollah and Lebanon and um, he says we're going to send a message that will strike for generations to come. That's, that's a little bit unclear what he means, but knowing kind of the history of, let's just say, Mossad's you know, uh, pursuit of revenge, I, I hope this thing doesn't turn into an entire Arab versus Israel conflict. I'm not an expert on this by any means. You're saying that Turkey, a NATO member, was probably involved in an attack on Israel. How is that possible? That That's perplexing to me. Well, it's not a, involved in a direct attack on Israel any more than we are involved in a direct attack uh, against Russia. Remember, these are proxy operations. Right. But the Turks uh, had a key role in standing up ISIS. Turkish intelligence officers 
provided uh, all sorts of communication equipment, uh, advanced intelligence, and ultimately uh, the Turks uh, operate as a go-between to sell oil to finance ISIS. They, they are interested uh, in an agenda in the region that is completely unconnected to anything we want, or for that matter, Israel wants. Now, Israel knows that the Turks are unfriendly. Uh, Mr. Erdogan is hostile to the Turks, uh, excuse me, to uh, Israel and, and the Israeli state. So they have provided support and assistance and advice. And now beyond that, have they provided weapons? Now, I think most of the weapons that we're seeing used have come from other sources, certainly from Iran. And there are unconfirmed reports that some of these weapons have actually found their way through the Kosovo Arms Bazaar from Ukraine into uh, Gaza. I mean, anything is possible in the world today. Uh, Colonel, I want to make sure we have uh, adequate time. Can you tell us about your new organization, Our Country, Our Choice? It's Our Country, Our uh, our country, your choice. I'm sorry. I think I got, oh, no, that no, right. you got it right. No, you got it right. No, you got it right the first time. Uh, our country, our choice is a brand new organization. It's designed to essentially unite people across party lines. It was founded by uh, a group of people who said, "Look, I'm tired of these distinctions between Democrats and Republicans. They're they're artificial. They're unreal. It doesn't matter who you vote for. Policies never change." And all we have to do to confirm that is to go back over the last 30 years. And so we said, we need a new approach. We need to unite around some key issues. Key issue is end these overseas commitments to warfare. It's got to stop. We can't afford it. It's destroying us financially. $14 trillion were lost just over the last 20 years on these ridiculous uh, interventions. Secondly, uh, we've got to close down the borders. We've got to get control, not just of the southern border, but all of our borders, our coastal waters. We need to restore the rule of law and expel the people who are in our country illegally. We need to get control of, of who is actually in the country. We don't even yes. know. And we're worried about uh, you know what's happening today in the Middle East. We could wake up tomorrow morning with a nuclear accident, an attack on our uh, electrical grid, any numbers of different things executed by people inside the country who were admitted yes. freely without any attempt to vet them. I, I want to plug it again. It's OurCountryOurChoice.com. Colonel, I want to close on that thought, two minutes remaining. Is it fear-mongering to say that there could potentially be sleeper cells in this country that could execute terror and harm on the homeland? No, it's very real. It's very real. Just as the potential for this conflict in Israel to widen unless we exert some influence in the region to contain it. It's just as bad. So we need to stop focusing on what's happening overseas in the sense that uh, we need to start asking ourselves the key question, what do, we, what do we gain and what do we lose? When you commit yourself to military action, you need to think about that. We never ask that question. And we need to measure whatever we think we're going to achieve by how much we will lose. And the same thing is true with the border. All of these people that want open borders and think that that's humanitarian need to step back and look at the societal cohesion that's being destroyed, to look at the rise in criminality. I don't know how many crimes or, or misdemeanors are being committed by various illegals. I have no idea, but I know that the illegal population contains the very elements you're talking about. Some of these are people that work for Hezbollah, Hamas. A lot of people are, are in this country from other countries simply as foreign agents. They will respond to direction that they get overseas.